Yes, uh, just a housekeeping issue or two. Uh, folks, your, your microphones are muted. Welcome to our webinar. We'd love for you to ask questions. Use the question box that some of you have already uh, replied to me that you could not get the audio, but it appears we have that resolved. So uh, Mike has been with uh, GE Multiland quite a long time. Uh, what, Mike, why don't you tell them just a little bit, you know, one minute or less on your background and then go ahead and get started. Sure. Um, it's Mike Kramlachin. I'm the application engineer here for G Grid Solutions. I'm based in Orlando, Florida. Um, I've been with G about five years. I came across in the Alstom acquisition. Previous to that, I spent most of my career at Analyst in New York City as a protection and control engineer, as well as um, in the technical application groups doing uh, creating uh, automated test plans for microprocessor relays. So today's topic is going to be an introduction to 61850. Again, I apologize uh, for the delay. So let's just go get right into it. So 61850, IEC 61850, what is it? Can you see my screen, Mike? I can now, yes. Okay. So what is IEC 61850? So it, it is an international standard, so hence the IEC part of it. It's an international standard, and it's written or built around substation and plant automation systems. So specifically for what we need it for in our environment. Obviously, um, it is a communication standard, so it defines the communication between devices and the substation, industrial facility, generating facility, and all of the related um, system requirements for that system, uh, facility. So whether it's generators, transformers, breakers, it defines the communication and the modeling for all of those devices. Um, it supports all the automation functions and the engineering required for that. So not only does it define the services that these different pieces of equipment should be communicating, it also defines from the ground up, uh, you know, from an engineering perspective also. So it goes beyond just being a communication protocol. It is uh, more of an object-oriented uh, protocol. Um, and the idea, one of the ideas behind 61 at 50, that it's, uh, with it being so broad and so technical and flexible, that it makes it a bit, uh, a bit future-proof that any applications and things that come out in the future, it can be fit into the IC61 at 50 model. It is defined entirely on Ethernet, so it does not support serial. So because of that, Ethernet communication becomes an integral part of what we need to understand. So before you know, we dive right into 61 and 50, let's get an understanding of Ethernet networks and what, why we use Ethernet networks for IC61 and 50. So the main benefit of using Ethernet networks in general is it's a multi, it supports multiple protocols. So we could have IC61 and 50, we could have TNP, we could have Modbus communicating on the same physical medium. So it's a common mechanism for any device to access. It's widely available. Um, the technology has been out for a while, so it's a very mature technology. And everybody on the call today has had some interaction with Ethernet in one way or the other, your Wi-Fi connection in your house, um, your ISP connection coming in from your uh, internet service provider to your, uh, mod to your modem in your house. So it's very flexible, um, it's easily deployable, and the mechanisms um, are available widely in the market today. So the medium that we use, the uh, popular one is the RJ45, so that's widely available in the market today. Then fiber optic communication is also available via Ethernet. And the reason for choosing fiber optic over Ethernet is fiber optic gives us um, the benefits of being able to go longer distances 
between connections. So we're talking about hundreds of kilometers, depending on the type of fiber that's used. It's a mute to electrical noise um, to severe. A45. Um, if you are going to use RJ45, make sure it's shielded twisted pair. So it reduces the susceptibility to noise, but not completely eliminates it. Going to fiber completely eliminates the susceptibility to noise. Uh, it is harder to terminate and work with than RJ45, obviously, because it is a glass. Um, so you need special tools and equipment to be able to terminate, to test, and maintain the fiber optic communications. So when we talk about Ethernet um, technology, too, we need to talk about topologies. What type of topologies do we need to um, build, or what type of topology fits our needs? So I'll go through some of the basic topologies that um, are available and that we use today. This, well, the first one on the left is a star architecture. Uh, the star architecture, um, basically, uh, it's um, not as it's not it's the most basic type of architecture where it's a connection from your devices into your switch, and then your switch takes it to, as I'm shown as picture, some maybe the computer, a maintenance computer, or a SCADA system somewhere. The disadvantages of having the star architecture, a single point of failure can cause a loss of communication. Um, there is a way to make this redundant by creating a redundant star architecture. But additional Ethernet switches are required. There's a more robust type of architecture. If you are going to add Ethernet switches, there's a most more robust type of architecture called PRP that we'll talk about later. So if you do have a break in the communication the, and you have to recover that communication path, there could be approximately three to five milliseconds for the recovery times, which for protection, you know, might be um, uh, not that good. The other topology that gives us a little bit more uh, of redundancy is the mesh architecture. So there's multiple between the uh, switch and the endpoint devices. So you have one break in that communication, you have an alternate path where that uh, information can travel. So it gives us some level of uh, redundancy, but obviously additional payment is required to gain that redundancy. So we need to add um, more communication cable, RJ45, fiber optic, whatever the medium is that you're using. Uh, the uh, ring architecture is uh, another popular one that it, uh, architecture is used in, uh, in the IT world. A lot of the IT world uses the, the ring architecture. Uh, it provides uh, network redundancy by design. Um, it can use there. It can, uh, depending on the manufacturer, it might be proprietary techniques to create this ring architecture. So I know like um, Cisco and some of those uh, big uh, switch manufacturers, um, they have uh, proprietary techniques to use it. But there is a, um, a standard that, is, uh, that most switches use is RSTP uh, that you can use to create this ring architecture. If you use the RSTP standard, then you can be compatible with other switches within the architecture. So you can have different vendor switches, and if they use the RSTP ring uh, protocol, then they can um, be compatible with each other, not have to be um, married to one particular vendor. There is still a recovery time, so how the ring architecture works is you connect the switches or devices in the ring network. If there is a break in one of those connections, the communication is still maintained by the other part of the ring. So if I have the top ring broken, then the bottom ring is still available for that communication to flow or that data to flow. However, there is a recovery time. So if there is a break in that communication, there is a recovery time for the data to flow in the other part of the ring. And that could be the 
uh, with RSCP could be up to five milliseconds. So again, there is some delay in the recovery mechanism. It is a most cost-effective solution because compared to the, uh, the redundant star or the mesh architecture, I don't need to have additional switches and I don't need to have those additional um, communication cables that I need to run. We talked about the, uh, so this is within, you know, wired, everything is wired together. What if we need to go distances where we might not be able to run fiber optic, we might be, not, the physical you know, barriers might not allow us to run a physical cable or physical fiber optic cable. There are other technologies out there um, for Ethernet over wireless considerations also. So uh, for GE, this, uh, we provide this in our MDS or Orbit Radio, depending on the uh, type, whether it's unlicensed or licensed. It is a cost-effective way of transporting data over Ethernet communications, where um, you know we might have budget constraints, as I mentioned, or you cannot run the physical cable. So this is an option. Um, they can go, the distances can go depending on the type of radius that we select or use. We can go up to 10 uh, to 15 to 30 miles. So it's a pretty lengthy distances. And, uh, and even if we need to go further, we could add um, repeaters maybe to, uh, that we can go further than that. But of course, latency and data rates are reduced over. Uh, wireless. So compared to Ethernet, whether it's RJ45 or fiber optic, we can go up to one gigabit or one uh, gigabit MB, one GPPS. Um, so that allows us a lot of bandwidth, a lot of data that can flow in that bandwidth. However, with wireless, depending on the type of wireless, we're limited in how much data uh, that we can transmit in certain uh, time periods. So just be aware of that. So you might have to choose only critical data if you are developing wireless network. You can't, you might just have to choose the critical data that you need to be able to communicate over wireless. Um, this is not anything new. These technologies are existing. Um, GE, in terms of GE, we've had these technologies for a while. So this exists in, in installations today. So it's a try to tried and proven method of communicating over Ethernet. Uh, the other type of communication for Ethernet is sonar considerations. And this is basically what a lot of big companies will use for if they want to create their own internal Ethernet communication. They will use some sort of sonnet uh, technology to be able to transmit data. The advantage of using the sonic technology is you can transmit multiple types of data, not just Ethernet data. You can transmit voice data, you can transmit any type of data, not just Ethernet data. And the bandwidth, the bandwidth um, is, uh, there's no bottleneck for the bandwidth compared to the fiber optic. You can do uh, as much as 100 to 155 uh, megabits per second, and even up to gigabits if we go to fiber optic. And again, uh, this exists in uh, today's uh, environment. So this is not, again, something new. It's uh, something that's been out there. So both going further to build upon the ring architecture and the mesh and star architecture, more robust and reliable network redundancy uh, is called a PRP, parallel redundancy protocol. Uh, basically, it's an architecture where not only do the switches have to support it, but the end devices have to support it. So the end devices being, say, for example, relay, they have to have two physical communication ports on them and they have both have to support PRP. So the idea is you have, you create two separate, physically separate network, network A and network B, for example. So basically what happens is um, both relays are connected to the, the communication for both relays are connected to network A and B via the two ports. 
So there is a break, for example, in land A, land, uh, land B, then land A still uh, has a complete path for the communication to flow. And there is no recovery time because in normal operation, both of these networks are transmitting the information in real time. At the end device, the end device will reject the communication from one of the networks, depending which one comes in first. So uh, this is referred to what we call a bumpless recovery or a no recovery time. So compared to the five, three to five milliseconds recovery time that we talked about in the previous architecture, PRP basically has, there's a zero recovery time. It's always in operation, even if you lose the communication link. Uh, the other applications that we can use over Ethernet is time synchronization. So instead of um, in our legacy devices today, we have Hybrid B that we communicate, um, that we can communicate over the network, um, not over the network, but we do need the Hybrid B, we need a dedicated cable, which is usually a BNC cable, plugs into the device to give us the time sync. With Ethernet, we can use IEEE 1588, or commonly referred to as PTP, Precision Time Protocol, to synchronize our network. And the accuracy is as good as, if not better than IRB. It's less than one microsecond accuracy. So the type of time synchronization uh, can use this because of its accuracy. The IDs, all of the IDs will be synchronized over the network. So if you have a network built, the relays or meters or whatever devices you have are already have access to that network. So all you need is a 1588 clock to broadcast that signal of the network and all the devices in the network has that, have access to that signal where they can then synchronize. It is a hardware based uh, time synchronization methods. So the devices, all the devices have to support it to some extent. So your switches and your end devices have to support it. And that's the reason we need it to be hardware based is because uh, uh, to get the microsecond accuracy, we can't do this in software. It just takes too much time. So it needs to be hardware. Um, the protocol has a network delay mechanism built in, correction built in. So Remember, these they might, this Ethernet network might have multiple switches on them, so that traffic is going to traverse multiple switches before it gets to the endpoint. Each switch introduces a delay because it takes a finite time for when the switch receives the packet to the port that it needs to go. With PTP, um, if the switch supports PTP, what it does, it does the delay correction. So the end, by, the end devices know how much delay is in your network and they do the correction. Uh, it supports all of the Ethernet communication um, standards that we use for ensuring priority and reliable delivery of the data, as well as data segregation. Uh, so it supports VLAN or virtual LAN or quality of service of the data. And it can be used for synchrophasers. So synchrophasers are one of the most uh, application where you need accurate time sinks, microsecond accurate time sinks. So it can support um, all of these applications, including synchrophasers. You might ask yourself, why not use NTP or SNTP? Because those are network time synchronization protocols, NTP meaning network time protocol, and SNTP being simple network time protocol. And the reason being is in the accuracy. Uh, NTP and SNTP is, uh, well, we're talking about millisecond accuracy compared to PTP, which is in the microsecond accuracy. So yes, you can use NTP to synchronize your end devices or SNTP, but bear in mind the accuracy is not um, going to be that great. It's definitely, you cannot use NTP and SNTP for synchrophasers because the accuracy requirements for synchrophaser is microsecond. So now that we've understand um, internet communication, some of the architectures that we use in internet communication, why you know, internet communication, what are the, uh, the advantages it gives us um, to, in today's environment, let's talk about how do we use 61 and 50, what 61 and 50 is. 
So the scope of 61 and 50, um, as I mentioned, it tries to address all aspects of substation communication, substation industrial, generating any type of our type of environment for communication and configuration of the, of the substation or industrial complex. What it attempts to do, it attempts to take the physical things in the world, in this example, for example, the breaker, and it virtualizes it. So it takes it, that physical device, it creates a model, and it digitizes that model and creates a virtual model of it. So in this case, in this example, I'm showing the example of a circuit breaker. So the circuit breaker model, so when we model a physical aspect in our substation in the IC61 and 50 virtual world, we refer to as a logical node. So that virtual model of the breaker is a logical node. And then within 61 and 50, each virtual uh, logical node is given a, a nomenclature. And in this case, that nomenclature for uh, breaker, for breaker is XCBR, X meaning a switchable device, and CBR means a breaker. Uh, breaker, so it's a switching device that's a breaker. So you might switching devices that disconnect switches, switching devices like isolators, and they are going to have different nomenclature. So it's 650 defined. If I see XCBR as a logical node in 61, it's 50. I know that it's modeling a breaker. Then it goes further to the logical node. It goes, it tells us what data has to be part of that logical node. So again, since this XCBR is modeling a breaker, what are the common things you would expect to see in a breaker model? Obviously, the position, right? So we need to know the position, open and close the breaker. Um, and then what type of uh, manipulation do we need to do with that position? Obviously, one, we need to know the status of that breaker position. And two, we need to control the status of that breaker positions, right? So we need to open and close it. So 61 and 50 defines all of that thing that it needs to be part of that Breaker logical node, it defines all the services that we need to apply. So open and close is one of the services that we need to apply to that model and all of the information that we need to get out of that model. I'm not gonna bog you down too much in some of the uh, nomenclature within 61 and 50 as a high level, since so this is more of an introduction, introductory class, just know that basically we take a model, a physical model, we virtualize it, we create a digital model of it, and we fit it within one of the logical nodes defined by 61 and 50. So some of the other logical nodes might be a current differential for current differential, overcurrent for overcurrent protection, um, power uh, CTs and PTs for our instrument transformers, uh, transformer logical node for information coming from transformers, generator logical nodes for information coming from generators. So anything that, any device that is within our substation environment or an industrial environment, 61 and 50 has a logical node model defined within the standard for it. So when a manufacturer says they're 61 and 50 compliant, that means that all of these logical nodes it supports within the device. So for example, a protection relay should support logical node for circuit breaker because of course it has to uh, control the circuit breaker. Um, at least trip it, maybe close it, depending on how you uh, implemented your, your design. And it needs to support certain protection logical nodes, right? So for example, overcurrent, distance, differential protection, all of that needs to be um, supported in that device. And in GE, all our um, C61 and 50 devices are compliant to third party testing. Meaning you can't just say as a manufacturer, hey, I subscribe to IC61 and 50, and that's the end of it. Um, to be really compliant with the standard, you wanna have some sort of third party to test your device to say, hey, you are in compliance with the standard. So we are compliant with third-party uh, testing. Um, 
to be compliant with the, the standard. Now, all of those, that information then gets transmitted to where it needs to, uh, where that data needs to go. So, for example, from the protection device, maybe I need to transmit the circuit breaker information to, for example, my SCADA. Because then my SCADA system needs to know what the circuit breaker position is and what the circuit breaker um, you know, how to control and close this, how to control open and close the circuit breaker. So there is a mechanism for transporting that data. There's a couple of mechanisms. So for SCADA purposes, we normally use what we call the MMS method of physically transferring that data from the relay over to my SCADA network. And that's defined in 61 and 50 again as MMS being a mechanism to be able to for that information. Oh, the reason we've chosen MMS is because it fits within the IC6150 model for all the services and the data class and all of that uh, that we need to um, send between devices. So the objectives of 61 and 50, creating all of these common logical nodes that you have to fit in or have to subscribe to is one of the main purposes to make it interoperable. So if somebody, relay manufacturer A, creates a model with a circuit breaker in it and relay manufacturer B creates a model with circuit breaker in it, those two models should be identical. So they should, the nomenclature will still be XCBR, the position should all should be included in the data with how that position is included in the data is specified how you act upon the position how you control it is specified in the standard so if two manufacturers two different manufacturers implemented with the according to the ic61 and 50 data model then they should be interoperable with each other then of course for information purposes um, as you Recall, and when we're talking about DNP and Modbus, those communication protocols, we need to define addresses or databases. So with 61 and 50, we refer to the information as self-descriptive. What that means is we know what that information is by just reading it because the 61 and 50 model comes with it. So when you read a piece like for the circuit breaker, you will read XCBR. So you know right away that's a circuit breaker. Compared to DNP, all you know is a register number or a Modbus, all you know is a register number. You don't know what data is contained in that register number. All you know, there's some data contained in a register number. You don't know what it is. You don't have to go into the manufacturer's DNP mapping or database mapping to figure out what that point is. In 61 and 50, that point is self-descriptive. So, so when you read that point, you know exactly what it is. You don't have to go anywhere else to tell what that data point is. And long-term stability, where these we can expand the stat the expand the standard to be able to you know incorporate applications in the future so that the standard is future proof and to create some sort of long-term stability for it for the future. Again, how the data model. So there's a couple of layers here. So the outer layer here is the physical device. So that physical device will contain a network address, usually your IP address uh, within your network to identify it within the network. And that physical device could be your relay. So example, your relay is the physical device. Then within that physical device, there's a logical device. So a logical device, so one physical device might contain about five logical devices. What is, what is a logical device? For example, again, in our example relay, a logical device in the relay is my protection. All of my data associated with protection is a logical device. Then what then are logical nodes or actual physical uh, virtualization of our physical quantities, right? So within a logical device, so for example, a protection logical device, you will have overcurrent, then you'll have differential, uh, you'll have distance, and so on and so forth. 
in a logical device that um, defines uh, your switches, for example, a switching logical device, you'll have, for example, XCDR, a breaker, you might disconnect switches. Um, you might also have the metering associated with the circuit breaker, right? So if you have CTs and PTs hooked up to that circuit breaker, you might have the metering associated. So MMXU logical mode for that physical device. And then of course, the data contained in those logical nodes, which is being referred to as what type of data is this? What data class is it? So um, for the logical node one, the XCBR logical node, that is defined as a position. And that's defined in the standard. For the measurement, MMXU logical node, that data class could be uh, amps or volts, right? So, and again, that's defined in the standard. From within the data class is the actual data. So we know in the XCBR logical node for data class position, we need to have status values, open and close. So SPV means the status value of the circuit breaker position. Q means the quality of that circuit breaker position. So there could be there's quality associated with every piece of data within the 61850 model. And the quality is how good that data is. So for example, if the circuit breaker position, if it's uh, you're getting it from an A and B contact, and for example, the A and B contact positions are not available or not good, then the quality will reflect how good that piece of information is. So when you receive it, you can, set, you can look at the quality and say, hey, that quality of that piece of information is not good. I should ignore it because it's not, um, I should not be using it in my process because I can't trust it. And then again, the same thing for the logical node two, which is a measurement class logical node. Uh, it's a data class, it's amps. So it's uh, the amps of that breaker, maybe. And then it has uh, the, the phase, the actual data. So A phase amps, B phase amps, C phase amps, so on and so forth. So when we take a physical device, so like for example, relay, as I mentioned, so in our physical device, say you are relay, a physical device, it, it's the actual, um, it virtualizes some things in it, right? So overcurrent, it has overcurrent, it has the CTTT ratios, uh, it has uh, maybe distance, it has differential, it has circuit breaker controls in it. So all of those, are contained within the physical device, and then the functions on those like are contained within the physical device and the actual data. So already with the modern microprocessor relay, relay, you can see the data by that's contained in the device can be easily mapped into 61850, right? So the physical device goes maps into the device name, then the virtual device, so whether it's a protection relay, can be then uh, mapped into the logical device and the functions. So overcurrent, undercurrent, voltage, then can be mapped into logical nodes. And then the data type will be mapped into the data class, whether it's currents, whether it's voltages. And then the actual data then gets mapped into the attributes of the 61850 data. So A-phase current, A-phase voltages. So for any micro modern microprocessor relay, it's very easy to map all of these the data source into the 61850 self-descriptive model. So as any, I'll look a little briefly at the architecture when we talk about 61850, what it what it looks like. You'll ref, you'll um, hear terms such as station bus and process bus. Basically, what the differences are: the process bus is your interface to your process equipment. So any of the signals that you get from your process equipment, what are your process equipment? The actual devices that drive your process, right? Motors, generators, breakers, transformers, and so on and so forth. So all of those interfaces uh, to my, to my 61850 device is called a process bus interface. And the station bus interface or the station LAN 
is refer referred to as my relay to relay communication, my relay to SCADA, my relay to uh, maintenance, to monitoring, to engineering stations, to, um, for example, monitor and diagnostic information. So all of that data that gets mapped from the, from the relay into all of those systems are called the station bus. Now, in this drawing, we're showing as two physically separate, and we do recommend if you're going to have a station bus and process bus that you keep them physically separate. However, they don't have to be. They could be logically separate, um, they could be the same physical devices, or they, and they could be logically separated. For an industrial environment, probably process bus. You, you're not going to see a lot of or be um, exposed to a lot of is the process bus um, is mainly digitizing all of your signals from your process equipment. For example, if I have a CT to digitize the currents coming from that CT and converting it to fiber optic, a digital signal which gets sent fiber optically from my breaker back to my control room. So one of the advantages of going with process bus or going with process bus you eliminate all of that cable, those physical cables that you need to run from your yard into your control room. Might not be as advantageous in a, um, for industrial because a lot of industrial have switchgear. The relays are located right in the switchgear panel. So that cable run is not physically not that prohibitive. But for example, a substation environment where you have the uh, for example, the um, utility breaker out in the yard somewhere, and then you have the relays maybe in a building in a control room, and you have to run all of those 10 odd or 8 odd, um, 10, eight odd uh, 10 gauge or 8 gauge conductors back to the control room. What you could do is install what we call a merging unit at the breaker location, and a merging unit then converts all of those analog signals to digital signals, signal and send it back to the relay over fiber optic. So one of one of the communication me, medium or means that you probably have heard of is boost messaging. Uh, boost messaging is a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism to transferring 61850 data. And peer-to-peer -peer, we meaning uh, device to devices. So for example, relay to relay. Uh, that not only transferring that information peer-to-peer, -peer, but transferring it in uh, reliable and um, with low latency. We're talking about from, from relay to relay for some legacy devices for eight milliseconds. In uh, newer devices, uh, you could get up, you could get less than a five millisecond delay. And if you can compare that to like some of our physical hardwired, which is can be up to 12 milliseconds. You can see it's even faster to faster than hard wiring. This is assuming we're using, using solid state outputs. If we use normal relay outputs, then of course it's going to be slower um, and it can go up to 12 seconds, 12 milliseconds in that case. So depending on the type of contacts that we use, whose messaging can be faster than your, your legacy hardwire uh, relay output controls that we're in our conventional stations. So not only is Goose a very reliable means of communicating information from peer-to-peer -peer device to device, but it's highly um, um, low latency, meaning it's uh, very, very fast. And 61 and 50 defined um, kind of has classes of, of um, who's processing. So if you're a protection class, you have to be less than, I think, two milliseconds processing of that boost message. So you have to be very fast in processing. And when we're talking about this five millisecond or eight milliseconds, I mentioned it's device to device, meaning how long it takes relay A to process the boost message and send it out, how long it takes the station, the, um, the ethernet to send that information and how long it takes the relay to receive and process that information and make a decision and operate the output content. Some of the applications for 
boost messaging. There are wide, widely lots of applications for boost messaging. Um, break of failure, transfer trip, load shedding, main time, main schemes. Uh, we'll, we'll pick a couple of these examples. We'll talk about a little more about uh, main time, main scheme and the zone interlocking scheme. But I wanted to mention there's a lot of wide application for 61850 boost messaging. Um, obviously, opening and closing um, uh, breakers. If you have, if you don't have a physical um, open and close signal going hardwired to your breaker, you can have a device out of your breaker where which receives a boost message and then trips the breaker physically. For that, you need to for that message to be very fast because obviously if there's a protection fault, you need to close that breaker very quickly. So boost message is a perfect. Uh, mechanism for doing that because it's reliable and fast. Um, other other control other applications include um, arc flash mitigation. So if you have a or maybe you have a um, a maintenance switch. So maybe you you can't physically wire a maintenance switch. So maybe you have a, a command from your SCADA to put to put your system into arc flash mode. So you can send that boost message from your SCADA into the relays and then the relays will then put the devices into our flash mode. Um, to virtualize lockout relays. So now with um, all of these devices being virtual, we can actually virtualize a lockout relay. So we can take all of that. What normally is contain all of those auxiliary outputs from a lockout relay and we can virtualize it into a physical device. And so we eliminate the lockout relay. And the trip signals associated with a lockout relay because the boost messaging again is very quickly, it basically mimics tripping a lockout relay. Uh, we refer to that usually as a virtual lockout. Uh, under frequency load shedding, fast load shedding schemes, recloser initiation. Um, if you have a pole top recloser, uh, you can you know initiate break of fail, uh, recloser initiation um, from from that, either either over Wi-Fi or physically connected over Ethernet. If you have uh, upstream relay tripping and blocking, so for example, if you have a relay upstream and you have a coordinated relay downstream, you know that the coordination time can be very lengthy. So in this, you can instead of waiting for that relay to trip because it needs to coordinate. You can send a goose message to speed up that coordination time. So let's just talk about some app, uh, some example of those applications, and one of them is the zone interlocking. So the zone interlocking protection scheme, a couple of uh, advantages it gives us is it can give it can give us some arc flash mitigation. So again, with the zone interlocking scheme, is you don't have to wait for that coordinate, for example, your main relay to coordinate with your downstream devices. You can send a goose signal from your downstream devices to the main relay telling it, hey, I have a fault in the feeder trip. Don't wait for the coordination time. So I could drastically speed up my tripping. I can lower my I squared T so I can lower my arc flash energy. I can use it as uh, instead of installing a low impedance bus differential relay or high, high impedance bus Protection relay, I can use zone interlocking as a means of tripping quickly for bus faults. So traditionally, the core, how we for all of these applications, how do we trip the main breaker? We usually coordinate with the field of relays. And that coordination time could be as much as as little as two milliseconds as much as 400 milliseconds. We're talking about 12 to 24 cycles of time between the coordination. So when a fault occurs in the feeder, that's how long I need to wait for that main breaker to trip. That's okay, usually, if I trip the, the feeder breaker, then I don't need to trip the main. But what happens if the fault's on the bus, then I still have to wait for that time period because I don't know if the fault's on the bus or it's on the feeder, so I need to wait for that time delay to determine, to make sure that the feeder breaker hasn't cleared that fault. With zone interlocking, I can basically bypass that time delay by, in this example here, for example, if I if there's a fault in the feeder, 
the feeder relay will send a goose messaging to the main relay, tell it, hey, I see a fault in my far direction. That means the fault is not on the bus. So, hey, main relay, do not trip, block from tripping. So I send what we call a blocking goose signal to the main relay to tell it, hey, don't trip because that fault is not on the bus. If there's a fault on the bus, that blocking signal does not get sent. So then once the transformer relays, the main relay sees that fault, it basically trips very quickly because it has not received that blocking signal to block it for, uh, to block it because that feeder relay did not see a fault in its far direction. Without the goose message blocking signal or the in zone, the bus zone interlocking signal, I would have to wait for that coordination time delay of two to 400 milliseconds for, for, for that trip to occur. With the blocking, with the goose zone interlocking protection scheme, I can drastically reduce that tripping time to about 50 to 60 milliseconds, even quicker than that, depending how robust my communication network is. Because remember, the Ethernet switch maybe adds two to four millisecond network, but this is in the worst, worst case scenario I'm talking about. Most Ethernet switches have a microsecond processing time. These are uh, worst case. Um, just a word on Ethernet switches is um, if you're going to create, uh, if you're going to design an Ethernet network, you don't want to use switches, for example, uh, consumer grade switches, like you don't want to use them from Amazon or Best Buy. Uh, you want to have substation class Ethernet switches because they're built for speed, they're um, low latency, they're built for bandwidth, and they're built for the environment. Just like a relay, they're built for the environment. They're built to withstand that industrial environment, temperatures and such. So I can drastically, drastically reduce that tripping time uh, from two to 300 milliseconds or even two to 400 milliseconds to um, less than 50 milliseconds. So we'll talk about the arc flash um, energy I squared T, that reduction that I'm gonna have. Same thing for a bus, uh, for a bus fault, if I'm not typically, if I don't use the zone interlocking for bus fault, I'm waiting 200 to 300 milliseconds to trip for that bus fault. As we know, with a bus fault, I can create tremendous, tremendous amounts of energy. 300 milliseconds is a lot of time for that fault to reside in our system. And that could cause catastrophic damage. Um, it can cause um, melting of the bus fire in the, in the cubicle, um, and it can cause damage where you basically maybe need to re re replace the, the piece of switch gear. Whereas with the zone interlocking, I could trip quicker. So it's a difference between repairing the switch gear and having to replace it. So the benefits I mentioned, uh, most, uh, most of them are flex reduction, eliminates the need for a bus differential relay, they're easy to be implemented for retrofit applications. All you need is a relay with 61 and 50, and you need, uh, and you need just to run the communication cables. Um, it's very high speed because it uses loose communication. It basically allows you, you know, you don't have to be able to, you know, have to do a lot of coordination studies. It allows you to be, you know, um, ease of relay coordination. It allows you to be more uh, don't have to do all of that um, back work to be able to coordinate effectively. No hardwire required between the devices, easy to set up and configure. If you use our devices or software, very, very easy to set up and configure loose messages. And one important thing I forgot to talk about, it's, it's monitoring the communication and it's being monitored constantly. So that if the, you have a break in the fiber, you have a protection device that goes down, you can alarm by the communication loss so that you know that your scheme is out of service for whatever reason. If you had a hard wire, you wouldn't know about it until something happens and it's too late at that point. Excuse me, sorry. The same thing, the main time, main transfer scheme, I think um, we might have an, another session on this in the future in more detail, but just at a high level, instead of hardwiring all of these signals 
back and forth between the two main relays and the tie relays, we send all of the signals over fiber optic or RJ45 over boost messaging. So it eliminates all the hard wiring we need to do between the main relay, the tie relay, the main one relay, the tie relay, the main two relay and tie relay. That's a lot of um, wiring that we need. We can eliminate and it's easy to implement a zone interlocking scheme because if the relays are already installed all i need is to add fiber optic communication or rj45 communication to be able to implement the zone uh, main time main scheme and at the same time again the communication is constantly monitored so if there is a problem with the scheme or the communication within the scheme i know about it right away but main time main transfer scheme if for example there's a break in one of the wires that goes from main one to the type relay i wouldn't know about it until the scheme is called upon to operate and does not operate properly and so just showing you how the scheme works um, if the breaker if you lose the main breaker on the normal um, in the normal condition the two main breakers are closed the tie breaker is open so this is a normally open tie so their scheme is normal. Then once you have a problem on one of your main, the breaker opens, you have an under voltage condition, you send a zone, you send a sorry, boost message it to the tie relay, tell it, hey, initiate the main time main transfer. The tie relay will then verify I've had an under voltage, I've had an under protected trip operate. I should then close the tie breaker to restore that bus section. Um, so uh, with that, so the advantage I mentioned, significant wiring reduction, uh, fast, because it's again using boost messaging, constantly monitored. If you already have a zone interlocking scheme imp implemented, you can easily implement a main time main and vice versa. If you have a main time main scheme implemented, you can easily um, implement a zone interlocking scheme by just settings in the relay. So with that, uh, Mike, were there any questions that came up? I don't see any on my end. So if anybody has any questions, um, I don't see any questions right now in the uh, question box. So um, unless Mike comes on uh, and asks a question, uh, we can close the seminar. It's uh, one o'clock again. Sorry for the late uh, technical difficulties there. Uh, hey, Mike, it's Michael here. <laughs> Oh, um, sorry. I don't see any questions. Over the tech merging unit for collecting field data. Okay. Um, yeah, I kind of brought through that because usually it's not something that we talk about much in industrial. So, yeah, the, the merging unit is um, defined in the 61850 standard, it's defined as a PIU process interface unit or RIU, a remote IO unit. So a merging unit is basically a combination of a process interface unit or a remote I and a remote IO unit. What it does is it gets installed next to close to the source of the information, for example, a breaker, so maybe in the breaker cabinet. It then gets wired to all the CTs and TTs that are available for that breaker. Uh, gets wired to all the signals that comes from that breaker, for example, the AMD contact of the breaker, the controls, the open and close controls of the breaker gets wired into that merging unit. And then going back to the relay or going back to the control room is just either an RJ45 or a fiber optics signal that goes back in, into the, your substation control room, into your relay. Your relay then subscribes to that information, makes the decision. So if it's reading the CT information and it sees a fault, it will then send the goose message back to the merging unit in the field and tell it, hey, I've, uh, based on the information you, you've sent me, there's a fault on this breaker, trip the breaker. And then the merging unit will subscribe to that goose message and trip the breaker. So it's a way of eliminating all of the wiring between your control room and out into your yard. Um, and also to have that information available for everything on your network. So if you use if you've used 61850 process bus, 
that information to that merging and it's not it's not only available to the relay that's protecting that breaker anymore like in a conventional sense where you have to wire all the cts and pts to that relay it's available to any relay that wants it on that network so in one application for that is if you have a failure of that relay you can re quickly reprogram a spare relay somewhere with the same settings of that breaker and quickly you're up and running you don't have to do any rewiring of that relay to get it back in service great uh we have one final question uh other than multi-function relays what other devices are implementing 61850 Goose communications? So obviously, um, the uh, most relay manufacturers in the market have implemented 60, and we've implemented 61850 for a while. But there are other devices like um, uh, like our dissolved gas analysis um, devices, um, our circuit breaker XCBR monitoring devices. Um, so a lot of manufacturers of all of the auxiliary equipment also are starting to implement 61 and 50 natively in their devices. So yeah, it's just not limited to the relays anymore. It could be any device within your substation control room. Obviously, some manufacturers are, um, are probably a little bit later to the table than, than, than some others, but most of the major manufacturers um, G being one of them, who have implemented 61 and 15 in all of our devices, not just the relays. So, for example, our DGA, I mentioned the Vols Gas Analysis devices, they support 61 and 15. Great job, Mike. Uh, thank you all so much for attending another L3 Levine web webinar. I hope that we'll see you again um, just, next just time. One, one Point, Mike. Um, is Eduardo was supposed to do this presentation. I think he sent you his presentation. My presentation is a bit different. So the handouts that you have, um, I'm looking at them. It's different from my presentation. So I'll send it to you for anybody that wants it. This is just a last minute change in the presenter. So, um, so I, there's some changes in the presentation also. Okay, sounds great. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, Hope guys. Everyone has a wonderful again, day. Apologies. Stay safe. Yep. Uh, apologies again for the technical difficulties. Take care.